Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m. beaming out to your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name's Melissa Blackburn and these talks are our chance to throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those new to the studio for whom this might be the first time you're engaging with us. For all those newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The PM Studio is a diverse and collaborative community, exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We are a partnership between Watershed, University of West of England and the University of Bristol. It's a home for early ideas, companies and a meeting place of both creative and commercial industries. And it's a studio space offering desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities all for free. And it's a space for art, a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. And talking of collaboration, we also run research projects. So for the next month, the teams behind the Southwest Creative Technology Network and Bristol and Bath Creative R&D are showcasing the work of our research fellows by taking over these lunchtime talks. We'll be looking at everything from data to digital placemaking and responsible innovation. So I'm a producer for the Southwest Creative Technology Network, which is funded by Research England's Connecting Capability Fund, and which aims to increase the use of technologies across the Southwest and support business growth. So you can see more about our work at www.swctn.org.uk. For this week's talk, we welcome the Southwest Creative Technology, Technology Network Data Fellows, Grace Quantock, Joanne Boyce, and Hannah Little. They will be exploring our human relationship with data from how it helps us understand ourselves and others to the consequences of data misrepresenting us or exposing aspects of ourselves that we might want to keep private. Just a very quick content warning. We will be talking about trauma and its effects. And we'll also be discussing the Black Lives Matter movement and racial bias. There's gonna be a Q&A at the end with the talk running for roughly 30 minutes. And if you want to ask questions, just pop them in the chat window and I'll pick them out to ask the speakers or you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. A captioned and recorded version of this talk will be available after the talk is finished. But before we start, next week's talk is how to build a responsible and sustainable culture that helps your organization thrive. This is a really great talk. Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Fellows, Sam Brown and Alex Mecklenburg will be discussing their new community interest company, Consequential, which supports those who invest, accelerate or scale digital and emerging technologies building their own responsible innovation practices and they will explore how the culture of an organization is integral to its ability to thrive and be a responsible member of its community so you can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at pm studio uk on twitter or at pervasive media studio on instagram or subscribing to our newsletter on our website and don't forget subscribe to this youtube channel and give the video a thumbs up. And the more subscribers we get, the more, we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link now or any of your socials. So for now, I'm going to hand over to today's speakers, Grace, Joanne and Hannah. Hi, I'm Grace Quantock. I am a new talent fellow in data with the Southwest Creative Technology Network. I'm also a therapist, writer, 
non-executive director across health, human rights and social care, and the creator of postcards from themargins.com. And I'm at Grace underscore Quantock on Twitter. And I'd like to hand over to Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne Boyce. I am the founder of The Social Detail, which is a inclusive marketing consultancy agency. Ooh, a lot of words. I'm also um, um, the founder of the BME Collective, which is a meetup group for black and brown people in Bristol. And I'm a data fellow researching bias within data with Swicton. I'm gonna hand over to Hannah. Hello, uh, my name's uh, Hannah Little. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England, um, uh, specifically uh, a lecturer in science communication. And I have a special interest in um, uh, communicating about digital rights uh, and data rights. Um, I also do a lot of work with um, the Open Rights Group. Uh, I'm on their support council and run their events in Bristol. Um, and I'm also on their uh, board of directors. Uh, and also a data fellow uh, with Swicton. Um, I'm gonna pass back to Grace now, uh, who's gonna do an introduction of her research. Thank you, Hannah. Hi, so I am delighted to be sharing this with you today and talk a little bit about my research. And as we're all contributing to this wider conversation about humans and data and our interactions with them. So as a psychotherapeutic counselor, and a writer, my work day to day is embedded in the collection, processing, understanding, and sharing of stories. So this embodied human data is rich and multi-layered. And often I uh, work predominantly with people with multiple marginalized, minoritized or oppressed identities and uh, trauma, often complex trauma. And in these situations, and for many of these people, uh, trauma is often overwhelming. Um, so traditional psychoanalytic theory orients disturbance or um, challenges and difficulties in processing uh, and interacting and engaging uh, in an individual psychological processes. So for example, if uh, somebody were to come into a consulting room in a very traditional psychoanalytic sense, perhaps, and talk about uh, their difficulties with, hey, something, a global pandemic, for example, uh, that level of theorizing might uh, ask, why is this individual struggling with the pandemic? What's happening in their internal systems or in their family systems uh, to mean that this is something that they can't process or that they're struggling with? So that's not what we're asking here because you know we don't make our own internal, uh, as, as, it, as the phrase that goes, weather all on our own. We're impacted by external events, just as we're impacted by our own uh, blueprints and ways of, of, of working and relating to people. And so I noticed that in um, a great deal of technology, this is something which I feel is often mirrored. And I'm gonna come back to a little bit more about that. But what I'm wanting to emphasize in this moment is to think that instead of always questioning what's happening to us, we're looking at where does the responsibility lie? Struggling the global pandemic? The responsibility is not ours alone. There is a global pandemic. Um, so it's then parsing out what's mine and what's external. So many layers of data are often feeding into an individual's experience, trauma or difficulty processing something or, or, or dealing with something. So these could be cultural, relational, intergenerational, socio-historical, transpersonal, trans-historical layers that can be impacting each individual process and interaction. And all these interweaving layers of story, experience and understanding can contribute to overwhelm. Uh, this overwhelm can trigger a trauma response of fight, you've heard of fight or flight, we could have kind of fight, flight, freeze, friend and flop, uh, which generally disengages us relationally. So when that happens, we can't consent or take choiceful action anymore, because we're not there. And I uh, worked around this with making a self care checking catalogue. So uh, working with clients or readers of mine around when you've been scrolling for hours and you've kind of fallen into the internet in some mud pool sense. And you uh, are, you kind of come to and you realize, wow, I've been scrolling for, for 
really far too long and somebody's replaced my spine with sticks and that hurts and that seems kind of mean and you know you, you, that, all that happens so what happens there in that moment in that transition because quite often there weren't choice points there weren't clear options when we were falling in and scrolling um so if we have difficulty with that with um handling uh, choicefulness and powerlessness, this can really intersect with uh, creative technologies and online and tech engagement. So that's the intro to what I'm doing at this moment. And I would love to hand over to Joanne to hear more about what she's working on. Super fascinating, Grace. I always enjoy whenever we get to speak about these things. Um, so I'm approaching the data research from my marketing background and essentially looking at how we can help and use data to support people in marginalized groups through machine learning and AI. So some of the questions I started to ask while conducting this research is how can data be positively biased to help those in marginalized groups? And how can we train a machine model with this positively biased data to have better outcomes for those from marginalized backgrounds. So to define a little what I mean by marginalized groups, it's essentially someone who's not necessarily represented in the AI sphere at the moment. So a lot of the examples of these are when you see platforms not being able to recognize, identify individuals from black and brown backgrounds or darker skin tones or individuals from the Asian community <clears throat> in facial recognition. That's a long process of situations which hasn't included those people in the making of the AI models. So to start exploring this question, I began to look at the journey of data and how can that be influenced? Just to remind, um, the point is to bias this data, but in the sense of it being positive. So some of the angles I was looking at is if we were to have a data set of the population of Earth, for example, and that population was 80% male and 20% women, the data sets that I would want to put into a machine to see the outcome would be 80% women and 20% male. So looking at what would go through, what the data would go through while going on to machine training from collection to learning the model, there's a lot of points I can see where bias can be intercepted and possibly balanced and where it's in the current system being influenced to not benefit those from marginalized groups. So you have the initial data collection stage where exploring the lack of representation in data sets where necessarily the data collection of people of marginalized background isn't always done in a consensual way and isn't always of actual people. There's a lot of models out there which are creating fake data images of people's faces because they're not able to collect those from marginalized groups for many reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is a lot of times, especially with the Black community being tested on for various medical research and different modeling, the fear of giving up data willingly is extreme and most of the times doesn't benefit them. So that's in the data collection and data set aspect. Then you also have the data labeling aspect where studies done on which expose data labeling sets like ImageNet, which would label Black and Brown people with derogatory terms like monkey or gorilla, a lot of that data labeling is either done by models which are already entrained on the bias of society or done by humans. To me, that's another area where we can input positive bias in the sense of a data scientist I've spoken to recently use data labeling machines and um, data labeling agencies, not machines, of human labelers in Asia. And what he found was that when testing the models on Asian faces, the accuracy would be higher. And also when testing perceived ages, the perceived perception would be within five years. So that's a clear example of when the labelers are from the same ethnic background of the images that they're labeling, they're able to increase the accuracy. This was then moved on to the data cleaning aspect and all of those enhanced, enhanced benefits for the Asian community was then removed by the data scientists in order to create a somewhat fair um, data set as it went through the model. In the research I'm looking at, that's where if we're looking at creating a data set that 
benefits marginalized groups, you'd want to have labelers from marginalized backgrounds and solely those to input their own biases. However, the complexity of intersectional data lies in the sense of no matter how diverse the labelers are, we will still have to correct for things like colorism, because no matter the society, they're always going to favor or label images of lighter skin tones as pretty. So those are some of the areas that I've been exploring and looking at. Um, one of the actions that I've done out of those was creating a machine model that can identify imagery between Michelle Obama or Lupita Lipiongo. It was really good exploring that and feeding a machine model simply pictures of black women and seeing, okay, what would it do if I was to feed in something that wasn't a black woman? Um, and interestingly enough, the model returned that the image was 50% Michelle Obama, even though it had no relations. My, for my research, the only example I can say to that is that Michelle, there's more pictures on the internet of Michelle Obama with people of different backgrounds than there are of Lupita Lipiongo. So that's already kind of balancing and um, exploring the research of what can be done. And also looking at the question of why hasn't this been done is the benefits. That model that I've built doesn't benefit anyone unless they mistaken Michelle and Lupita. Um, they want to identify which is which, which I hope people don't mix up, but <laughs> there's not a lot of benefit in that research. So it's been really good to explore and kind of try and figure out how can we make these models solely benefit to the people that aren't necessarily being represented. Another aspect of the work, as I mentioned earlier, was intersectional data. When looking at working with marginalized groups, there's a lot of aspects that doesn't get accounted for. In the current stages of training machine models, it very much began as identifying humans and teaching a model to identify humans and it happened to be, um, whether unconscious or conscious, men. Then they went on to identifying women, and now they're trying to identify people of different races. But if we really want to create a machine model or data that's truly intersectional, you need to look at all aspects of the human identity and therefore make some of those aspects binary. So trying to create an intersectional data set means making some characteristics which are intrinsic to us and our personalities binary. And that has been quite difficult in the sense of how do you classify religion for someone, for a machine to understand in a binary sense? And how do you classify someone's um, sexuality for a machine to understand in a binary sense when it's so fluid to us in language and in terms? So a lot of this stuff has been explored in the sense of trying to undo what has already been done. And my research has been looking at how can we just start with bias at the start and intentionally. So I think with that viewpoint, we can then create what everyone's striving to right now, which is fairer systems. So that's my research thus far. I'm looking to continue exploring, building out models and testing different systems and also pulling heavy from the work of gender shades where they're testing various platforms, but with the intention of bias in mind. I'm not gonna pass over to Hannah Little. Hi everybody. Um, so my research uh, is all about how to communicate about um, data rights. Um, uh, and that's really, really important because data rights is something that um, affects almost everybody in the world in, in, in quite significant ways and, and in increasing, increasingly um, big ways. Um, but it necessarily requires um, a specialist knowledge of um, not only issues around how data might be collected or, or how it might be used, um, but also um, issues of, of biases that, that um, both Grace and Joanne have, have touched on there. Um, and there's um, ethical issues when communicating or creating communication strategies, um, any communication strategy, whether that's in marketing, uh, and Joanne knows way more about that than I do, um, uh, when you're kind of putting people in these um, uh, silos that relate to their gender or their location or their age or their race, um, uh, but there's um, potentially even worse ethical uh, problems when you um, 
try and target people too specifically based on their individual characteristics, who they are as a person, where they go on the internet, uh, what websites they visit, how they answer some questions on Facebook, um, and the whole Cambridge Analytica kind of scandal has demonstrated exactly why that might be uh, a problem. So we've got an issue with using um, what I call big identities, which are all about our demographic characteristics, uh, and potentially even worse issues with using little I, uh, I identities um, uh, because of, of things like Cambridge Analytica. So creating ethical communication strategies is really, really tricky if you want something that's really, really effective, because say what you like about Cambridge Analytica, what they did was effective. Uh, it, it worked at communicating what they wanted to communicate, right? Um, but I think we can learn from that without being unethical in the ways uh, that they were um, uh, and building something that, that is effective but ethical. Uh, and that's my, my goal. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the challenges section, um, specifically the challenges around how we kind of create that balance between being effective and being ethical. Um, but I just wanted to use this time to illustrate some of the issues that I um, that I'm talking about when I'm kind of saying these things are important to communicate. Uh, what are the things that I want to communicate? So um, my my project's very much too layered in layered in terms of why it's important to data rights. It's like first and foremost, talking about communicating data rights, but also the data rights associated with communicating data rights, and then it's data rights all the way down. Um, so I've got three examples of kind of very recent um, issues that um, uh, are important for, for data rights issues for people in the UK at the minute. Um, the first one is the one that's at the front of everybody's mind um, at all times, and it, that's COVID-19. So obviously the government is undergoing huge amounts of uh, data collection uh, through their um, track and um, test, test and trace um, program. Too many T's, sorry. Um, and uh, the, the, what um, Open Rights Group have, have, have recently done is, is taken the government to court over the fact that they didn't run out, roll out a, a privacy assessment um, before they rolled out the, the test and trace program, um, which is required by law. Uh, so the government broke the law. Uh, again. <laughs> um, the second one is is the Brexit deal, which uh, is uh, coming up. Uh, I know everybody sort of seems to have forgot about Brexit, but it's still happening, guys. Um, and uh, at the minute, the UK is in negotiation with the US uh, about a trade deal, uh, which is obviously very, very important for our economy. Should we leave the EU? Um, and we want to kind of keep those, those um, uh, trade lines open. However, a lot of our existing um, data rights laws come directly from the EU through things like GDPR. Um, and the US is, is very much putting our government under enormous pressure to kind of uh, massively water down uh, the privacy protections that we have um, in order for their kind of big tech giants to operate um, however they like in our country uh, without the kind of restrictions of the EU. Um, uh, and we need to keep an eye on that. Um, and then the third one is um, ad tech, uh, which is um, the thing that follows us around the internet and serves as ads all the time, these annoying things that pop up and they tell us that uh, we want to buy a wheelbarrow even though we just bought one yesterday because it knows that we just bought one yesterday and we've been searching for wheelbarrows. Um, so that they, um, yeah, they know where you've been on the internet, they, they follow you um, and they sell that data to each other and they um, put the, that data and, and combine it with the other data sets that they already have to create these enormous, really accurate profiles of us to serve as ads, um, a lot of the time without even us being aware of it. Um, and all of these things should be kind of under the purview and, and being controlled by our, the regulator, our, um, the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, but they're kind of uh, demonstrating regulation at, at various levels of um, uh, detail. <laughs> uh, and it's all very interesting and, and it affects our lives massively, but very few people are kind of aware that these things go on. And that's only three things um, that I've mentioned there, but there's, there's all sorts of, of things that we, we need to, um, kind of the, the public large to be um, aware of and engage with. Um, and so, yes, that's the the aim of my project is to is to get everybody on board with discussing these things and aware of these things. Um, so I'm going to pass back to Grace now, who's going to talk about the challenges of her project. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing all you shared. Um, I agree, we certainly do need to keep an eye on this and I'm glad that your research is contributing to that. Um, so for me, uh, I'm starting with a challenge we're going to take as a given doing research as a disabled woman in global pandemic, because we all know about that. But aside from that, multiple difficulties. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in my research thus far is rather than taking creative technology into the therapeutic process, or, tr or vice versa, um, or looking at the individual self-management. So this is kind of where, you know, we say you have mental illness, it's like, we'll give you an app. Like, and that can be great and the apps can be fantastic, but uh, that's not what we're looking at here at the moment. Uh, what I'm looking at is to research and researching how creatives and technological culture makers can frame the delivery of their outputs um, to responsively mediate data processing, particularly for people who have significant trauma loads. So as creative technologists, how can we work in a way that's trauma informed and that titrates data delivery in a way that is uh, uh, ethical, really? Um, so one of my first challenges in beginning this uh, was I realized that the psychotherapeutic models that I was working from uh, were not intersectional. And, you know, I, I realized this and, you know, researching it discovered that because uh, some of my research was based on Jungian work, and some of it was on Gestalt. Um, and although these were what I've been taught in professional training, um, I looking into it further, um, I discovered that when these theories were created, uh, people like me, disabled people, um, were still in institutions and asylums. So we weren't there, so we weren't included. Um, and you know, in many ways would have been considered, considered not able or not worth including. Um, and so there is a lot of this huge uh, amounts of prejudice, racism, uh, ableism uh, and across the spectrum of your lived experience we have prejudice within uh, the therapeutic uh, realms and community and theories. Um, so for example um, uh, there is a there is a therapist called Carl Rogers who you know come across a very famous humanistic the founder of humanistic uh, counseling and uh, there are what's called there, there are tapes of Rogers doing counseling which we often watch in psychotherapy trainings there is a tape of Rogers counseling a young black man who is in remission from leukemia um, however in that tape blackness is not mentioned it is avoided and so that's one problem and secondly in multiple therapeutic trainings uh, I was only shown Rogers counselling white people. I did not know of the existence of this other tape until very recently. Uh, and, you know, we did uh, at one training have two days on working with difference. I was really excited because I thought they were going to teach me how to work with like straight non-disabled men. So I was like, that's a really tough client. Like, like that, that would be great. I'd really love that. They did not teach me. I was not taught that. I was, people were taught how to kind of work with people like me. Um, it was not ideal. Uh, and I know that everybody is, you know, in a, in a development, uh, well, many people and the people that need to be in a, a process of this. Um, and uh, an, an inclusion journey. And it's something I'm looking to contribute to, which is why I'm doing part of this research and speaking out like this now. Um, and uh, there, and in some ways I am still uh, doing some reparative work after experiencing uh, immersion in theories which were uh, very, very narrow in their, their gender binaries and uh, uh, middle-classness and uh, a lack of uh, disability inclusion and lack of basically any inclusion other than, than the centered white gaze. So um, another challenge is, so I'm looking to, I have been adding in other uh, theories and looking to build the, uh, the matrix in an intersectional way. Um, one other challenge is that um, tech uh, is often approached as a fixed, as a fix. There's an ableist idea of relieving the burden of care and uh, or of working or spending time with folks with trauma. But here I'm refuting all of that ableist nonsense and uh, actually asking creative technologists to extend engagement in the uptake and use and well-being um, to actually think through where their work interrelates with trauma. Um, and mental health is a highly impactful field 
but in the kind of uh, where it meets corporate work, it's often dominated by certain therapeutic models, particularly ones that can give a very quantitative outcome. Um, and I, uh, I'm asking people to get closer to the process a user with trauma goes through with the products. So it's a much more relational, quantitative way of working. And so, so these are some of the challenges that I am negotiating and navigating. I'm very lucky to have the support of a fantastic cohort on this fellowship um, and to have the opportunity to spend time with teachers and have producers like Melissa and uh, also to uh, have the, the work that I've done with people with trauma and alongside them. So all that's building into uh, what I'm going, as I'm going forward and developing and working uh, to really get uh, work alongside people's lived experience uh, in this research. Thank you. And now I am going to hand over to Joanne who's going to share a little bit about her challenges. Yeah, a lot of my challenges heavily relates to the areas that um, Grace and Hannah have already mentioned. And one of the biggest things is I'm looking to build or to imagine what a data set of solely marginalized data would look like. That alone is having to explain what data collection is, how is your data being collected, and getting consent from individuals who necessarily don't either understand what that data has been done or used or how it's being used. So speaking to a little bit of Hannah's aspect in terms of communicating, and then the trauma aspect in the sense of any data collection on these individuals would have been used for negative impacts. So when you're speaking of facial recognition, people's main awareness, especially black people is the use of facial recognition software to identify protesters in the Black Lives Matter and then trying to arrest or incarcerate those individuals. So there's a very valid mistrust in data collection and in using software and tools to solve issues. Um, another challenge in itself is also my own biases in the sense of I am a black woman, so I am very aware of marginalization concepts and I'm in very aware of what I think the benefit would be but that's not necessarily in terms of when I speak to people who already work in this field so the conversation and the structure of those conversations is very different also my knowledge in marketing um I, I absolutely love that Hannah mentioned Cambridge Analytica being something that we can see as a benefit because what they did was always feasible on Facebook as a Facebook marketer you can get a collect a lot of data and even if you're targeting to the American market you can target based on people's race and a lot of people don't know that they don't know why they're seeing content so there's a lot of danger in that aspect um, but it offers a lot of opportunity if there was going to be data collection on solely marginalized groups you can target those groups particularly to collect that data from them but the ethics in that is where does that lie where does it lie if I'm solely trying to collect data from these groups and not clearly explaining to them what will happen to it or how it will be labeled? And that's the current process now, but that shouldn't be the way it is. The other aspect is I'm looking to apply all of this into a marketing sense in terms of how creativity and campaigns and co marketing copy is produced and diversifying that. But creativity in itself is not a staged process things iterate and change throughout the, just before a campaign goes live, it can change five different times. So at what point do I see this knowledge of bias being inputted in a campaign and marketing campaign and trying to map that process? So that's the next step I'm looking to um, look at, at how can data bias awareness be mapped into the marketer journey? is very much the marketer journey is put the content out and then review the data after. However, could we use the data, could we use this knowledge to put out more inclusive content? And one of my final challenges is mainly that this hasn't been done. Um, again, for many reasons, mainly ethics. A lot of the characteristics that I'm looking at to create this intersectional data set are protected characteristics. Um, ask Asking people to label someone or to look at someone and guess their sexuality or a type of disability is not something that 
we say we do. And I, I use that phrase in quite intentionally because it is something we as humans do. And whether we say it out loud or not, we do do those things. But because there is this uncomfortability about the conversation when training machines, everyone's aware of their biases or not aware in terms of unconscious, but they're not telling the machine these, these complicated contexts. They're not saying that I will look at someone and assume that they might be autistic because of X, Y, and Z. However, they're feeding some aspect of that. And it may be a sense of they're feeding into a machine that, okay, I look at someone and assume these things, but that's not the reason I didn't hire them for the job. The machine has to draw another comparison. So it hasn't been done for the fact of the ethics, the fact of it could be also used for negativity in the sense of with Black Lives Matter and facial recognition, one of the main issues with facial recognition is that it falsely identifies people from darker skin and black and brown backgrounds. So that's a negative use of that. However, if more black and brown people are included in data sets and we build machines that can identify us, that false identification could be reduced, but also it could also be used to push the patriarchy and to push the current injustice systems we have in policing, in society, in terms of the marketing sense, it can push more colorism and the production of removing darker skin tone models from magazines. So the ethics balance is, is quite difficult in the sense this can be used for good, but it can also be used to continue what we already have in society. Those are some of the things I've been exploring and trying to really understand how it fits into my research, where the research crosses over into the potential impact it can have, um, always focusing on the marketing context or the impact in terms of understanding a campaign or seeing visual representation or even ad revenue for clients, but then the greater impact into what is machine learning and AI doing for society. So I'm going to pass over to Hannah to discuss some of her challenges. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm going to discuss challenges, um, but I'm also going to try and propose some solutions uh, to those challenges uh, almost immediately. Um, so uh, that's good news for me, I guess. Um, so one of the biggest challenges, as I said before, was how to create a, a communication strategy that's both um, effective but also ethical um, and we're not targeting individuals um, and surveilling individuals to find out as much about them as possible in order to create communications um, that target them specifically in line with their personalities um, and their what they do and what they like and, and who they are. Um, and so I mentioned uh, Cambridge Analytica before, um, and uh, if anybody's interested in kind of Cambridge Analytica and, and, um, and how they managed to pull off uh, what they did. I recommend this book, um, which uh, has a swear on the front, but it's starred out, so I, I hope that's fine for a lunchtime talk. Um, uh, the, uh, but in this book, it kind of explains a little bit about where some of the ideas um, of, of uh, Cambridge Analytica came from um, originally um, and, and some of the thinking behind it. Um, and a lot of the ideas came out of research that was done on the Liberal Democrats. Um, and the Liberal Democrats are really, really interesting uh, as a party and as a set of voters, because um, especially in relationship to this idea of identity, because when we think about um, how we politically vote, when you think about a Labour voter, people generally have um, quite a clear set of ideas about who they think Labour voters are. Uh, they're more likely to be uh, younger people, they're more likely um, perhaps to be uh, in the north of the country, maybe more likely to be um, poorer people. Um, uh, and there's also um, kind of demographics based on, on, on um, people's race and how they vote. Um, and these are all kind of these, what I call big I identities before. Um, and we've also got ideas about who we think um, the, uh, the 
conservative voters are, they're more likely to be richer, older, uh, perhaps more likely to live in the south of the country. Um, but when we, when I ask people, think of a, a liberal democrat voter, paint a picture in your mind, they get they get stuck, right? Who were the liberal democrats? Um, what are their um, characteristics? And so they did um, some research to kind of work out who liberal democrat voters are, um, and why they vote Demo liberal democrat and, and, and what they're kind of um, what makes you more likely to vote Liberal Democrat? And the things that they found weren't these big demographic things. It was more about how people um, saw themselves, what they did, um, and also personality traits. Liberal Democrats are apparently more likely to be gossipy people. Um, who you knew, um, based on this research, I'm not making broad uh, sweeping assumptions here. Um, uh, and using that information, they kind of started to think about, oh, we can use kind of, um, indicators that are more in line with people's behaviours and more in line with people's personalities in order to um, target them uh, with political messaging and that might be more effective than kind of thinking or oh, we'll send our political ad to people under 30 or to people who live in Gloucester or whatever kind of the, the, the um, patterns you found uh, in your uh, big data sets are. Um, and this got me thinking, uh, well, it kind of reminded me of some research that we have in visitor studies, in museum studies, um, that kind of found that there's different motivators for why people might visit cultural spaces, um, such as a museum. Some people go because they find it to be very restorative, restorative um, or kind of meditative. Some people go as a social activity. Some people go because they just need something to do with the kids. Some people go um, because they're seeking information and knowledge and, and, and they get a buzz out of that. Um, so lots of different people go to these spaces for different reasons. And, there's, and they're um, based on our behavior, they're based on our personality. They're not based on um, these uh, kind of bigger demographic uh, characteristics. Um, and museums use that knowledge that different people go for different reasons in order to design their spaces. Um, they put a cafe where they do, and they've thought about that and they put the exhibitions where they have, and they've thought about that, and they design their exhibitions in such a way that kind of ticks as many boxes as possible for all of these different people who visit for different reasons. Um, and that is a way to kind of target people specifically in relationship to their activities and their behaviors and their personalities, but not individually. It's trying to get as many people as possible with a very ethical strategy, right? I, I don't think anybody thinks it's unethical that the museums use this information about why people visit in order to kind of design their spaces. They're just trying to make uh, the, the spaces as good as possible for as many people as possible. Uh, and I think that we can learn from that when we talk about communication strategy online. And instead of trying to target things specifically for people using information that they don't know is even being collected and used, um, to create communication strategies that take as many boxes for as many people as possible in order to communicate as ethically as possible about the things that people need to know uh, about data. So that's what I'm trying to do at the minute is collect data, um, um, data on why people are interested in data rights and why people um, care about data rights in order to kind of start creating or designing some strategies that might be as effective as possible for as many people as possible. Um, to yeah to be as effective as possible while being ethical uh, and i'm gonna pass back to melissa now who's gonna ask some questions melissa you're on mute classic after all these all these months of living on zoom so thanks to joanne grace and hannah for all those very powerful insights actually before we do the q and I just wanted to explain that the Southwest Creative Technology Network, we started our data fellowship in April. So we've done, we've done three fellowships over this uh, last three years. And the data fellowship, uh, which um, followed on from immersion and automation, um, started just as lockdown kicked in. So the fellowship exists to support people from academia and industry and new talent to think about data. Uh, and there are 24 fellows and many of them have never met because of COVID-19, they're from the, across the Southwest. But they've been doing some amazing research um, and the last two talks that we've done at, at um, PM Studio lunchtime talks have reflected that. This one in particular has been, you know, some deep thinking about ethics and inclusion and data rights. Um, 
and trauma and psychotherapy. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. If you've got more questions, then please do let me know. Um, I'm just going to start with a very general question. Um, if everyone's there, you are there. Brilliant. In what ways does your research explore how data reflects our personhood in potentially unwanted ways? That was something that came up. Joy. Yeah. Um, I think having to put binary characteristics on things that people can change very easily and it's very fluid is something that my research is having a look at that it's very difficult to pin that down because that's so individual to the person it's so individual to their, their time and their life and how they are and to try and make that binary and apply that to a data set that can live on longer than the person is is yeah it's, it's tricky Grace, do you want to say anything about that? How does data reflect our personhood in potentially unwanted ways? Um, yes, so absolutely. Um, what I was thinking is um, uh, I feel that when uh, we are quantifying uh, aspects of our qualitative and lived experience, it can get very, very difficult. So, for example, you may have heard of the pain scale that's used up in hospitals, and there's a fantastic um, essay called The Pain Scale, which talks about the, the limits and how we find ourselves within that. And um, when uh, we can ask, you know, is trauma data? Um, can it be quantified? How can data reflect aspects of our personhood in a way that's problematic? And my answer to that is, um, I believe it is data because not only is it story and story can be data potentially, but also because it is quantified around us by institutions. So if you, for example, apply for um, disability benefits for the Department of Work and Pensions, and I wish for every single one of you who is watching this now or later that you never have to apply for disability benefits with the Department of Work and Pensions. I ask that you are spared such a thing. But if you are, then you will find that very um, lived experience and um, your, your personal and uh, the amount to which maybe we have nightmares or how this is or how it impacts you in your body is going to be scored and, and assessed. And, and so that, and this happens obviously in the medical model and also within the austerity uh, model in which we live under these days. Um, and so that is certainly a way that I feel it can be problematic. Thanks, yes. And, and many more people are going through that experience right now, aren't they? Okay. Anna. Um, I think for me, um, the most unwanted ways are the ways that are happening without our knowledge. Because mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times data reflects our personhood in really useful ways that makes our online experiences more efficient and personalized. Um, but when it's happening without our knowledge in ways to manipulate us without our knowledge, um, then it becomes really dangerous. Um, as well as um, potentially creating all sorts of bias in the in the world, uh, as as Joanne pointed out. Um, yeah, so that that's my answer. Brilliant, thank you. And Vanessa on on the chat said, "You've set my brain on fire," which is a high compliment, particularly from Vanessa. And she also said, "How how might we bring together the fast moving platforms and the slow moving official structures we have in place to protect people?" So. The slow moving structure, she says, just never seemed to catch up fast enough. Mm. So that's kind of about theory and process, I suppose. Um, Grace, do you want to talk about that? Um, yes, these are great questions. Thank you. And I hope that the brain fire is, is, is an enjoyable creative conflagration and not any type of overwhelm. Um, if anybody is overwhelmed, please always remember that this is going to come back to you as a recording with me captions so everybody can always pause and take breaks and come back to it in a way that's best to process. Um, that's official hat on there for a second. So um, I absolutely appreciate this and I think it is a great difficulty. Um, one thing that I, I sit on several uh, boards and, and, and work in relation to, pu to public policy um, at different intersections um, and one of the things that I can sometimes find is that 
to um, uh, to engage uh, the systems that we have, um, we can influence. And in my last research in uh, the Safa, the um, Bristol and Bath Creative R and D, I was researching how to influence appetite and aptitude for inclusive digital transformation at a commissioner level, at public policy level, um, and uh, actually storing conversations was a way to do that. But that is going to be sharing more in my in my next round of, of research sharing that is going to be coming very soon. Um, so I think one big way is if we have people who have lived experience and professional experience as my, my fellows here, if these people are feeding into or at the places that are making these decisions, then that can really help because that level of understanding, I think can certainly make things swifter. Um, I think we can work to influence appetite and aptitude towards that, that delivery. Um, and one thing is also um, having a, uh, understanding of expectations because sometimes it's easy to look from the outside and say oh, why don't we just do this and I'm not saying you're saying that in any sense but I know I have done it you know um, I, as a child perhaps I would look and go why don't they just do it properly but actually internally there's about 800,000 different levels that's not that many of um, of decisions and impacts that need to be uh, looked at so it's then how we go into that and what we need to let go of and what we need to stick really with and make those decisions transparent and accountable. Thank you. Brilliant. Hannah, what do you think? Tricky. It's tricky. Um, and I interpreted this question to be about technology moving very, very fast and laws to regulate technology moving really, really slow, which is a huge, huge problem and the root of basically all of our problems when it comes to digital rights and digital policy is that um yeah our the big tech company specific um specifically but i guess all technology moves a lot faster than than law the law can to regulate it and uh policy makers understanding of what's happening it moves a lot more slowly than what is happening um which is a huge problem and one that was illustrated really really well um when uh, i think it was the the us um senate interviewed or in, I guess interrogated Mark Zuckerberg and some of the questions they were asking really illustrated quite uh, how little they understood what was going on and, and why it was such a problem um, and I guess the solution to that would probably be public engagement but also the engagement with with policy makers specifically about what's going on and advocacy groups like Open Rights Group um, lobbying the government about specific uh, problems that are cropping up um, and making sure that we don't go backwards. So as I, I mentioned at the beginning, um, the, the trade deal with the US that's happening at the minute is potentially going to make us slide backwards because um, we're going to be subject to the US, what the US wants and what they want is subject to what their billion dollar companies want, um, which isn't necessarily in the, the best interests of the citizens of the United Kingdom. Um, and so not letting the people at the top um, dictate what's going to happen to us in terms of our uh, rights in, terms, in relationship to our data uh, and what happens in online spaces. Um, but making sure that, that when we make it clear what, what we want and that um, we know enough to, to know what's, what's, what the problems are. When, when all this happens uh, but it's just a huge problem <laughs> it's just a huge problem, a huge um, problem. and, and, and Joanne, John, Joanne you're obviously a, an expert on on social media in particular have you got a slant on that so my slant is extremely biased I think it's kind of down to marketing in the sense of if it, if someone was to run a campaign that broke down the Cambridge Analytica situation and how they used it and it was a one minute captioned Instagrammable video, a lot of people would consider themselves data scientists after watching that one video, because that's how we are as people. We take in information and it sticks with us because it's memorable. People remember um, adverts from their childhood because it's memorable. I think a lot of the barrier to a lot of this stuff is that it's very dry, it's very dense and sometimes overcomplicated. I A lot of my work is explaining how Facebook algorithms and targeting works to people. And about halfway through the explanation, especially with Facebook targeting, whoever I'm teaching is always in a bunch of shock. 
because they've they've received the the end um, experts of that they've received the ads they know they went onto a website and then it came through and they were targeted with this image and that but when they see how simple it is their whole perception changes the whole way that they view these ad targeting campaign changes so I, I think there's a there's space for um, um not necessarily a, a full movement but there's space out there for some particular campaigns which breaks down these things, breaks down policies, breaks down the gap in data, breaks down that, you know, machine recognition and facial recognition is not just because the whole system is full of white men, it's also the data input, it's also our involvement in the building of the research. But a lot of the public and a lot of the big companies expectation is just that people are going to opt in without knowing the basics. Um, and another aspect would be, it would be really, really fun if it was mandatory for any computer or any machine or software that uses these algorithms to make them open to the public. They would never do that. But if they were, like if I can get my hands on Facebook's targeting algorithm and play around with it, who knows what would happen? Again, there's also really bad ethics to this as well. Thanks, Joy. We're actually going to run out of time soon because we're nearly at two, two minutes to. Um, so I'm probably going to wrap up now and I just wanted to let you know there's loads of questions that we could have asked, uh, particularly about Michelle Obama and various things. <laughs> lots of lovely comments about brain fire and, uh, and how welcome it is to see um, um, deep thinking and focus on social justice. So um, I am going to wrap up now, I think, because um, we could go on all afternoon. Um, I just want to thank our panellists today um, and say again that you can follow um, what our Swipton Data Fellows are up to, our wonderful Swipton Data Fellows. You can follow on that, what they're up to on www.swctn.org.uk forward slash data. Um, next week's talk is how to build a responsible and sustainable culture that helps our organisation thrive. And again, that is Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Fellows, Sam Brown and Alex Mecklenburg will be discussing their community interest company, Consequential, and their work supporting digital companies to build a responsible innovation practices. So re I'd, I'd really recommend that talk. That will put your brain on fire as well. You get news about all our future talks by following on us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter and at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram and subscribe to our newsletter on our website as well. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and give the video a big thumbs up. So the more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Uh, please free, feel free to share the link to the talk. And if you have an idea for your own lunchtime talk, please drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again to Grace, Joanne and Hannah for a wonderful talk. And thanks for watching. And we'll see you all again here next week. <laughs>